Welcome to the sixth class on the book Revelation. Tonight we finish up the letters to the churches of Asia Minor. We've talked about three letters already, and we're going to pick up four more uh, tonight. So there's seven total letters that are written to these individual churches. These are real churches on a postal route uh, that John sends from the island of Patmos. If you remember, John is in exile on the island of Patmos. More than likely, John was at Ephesus when he was put in exile. And these are letters that are going to address individual issues for these churches. So these are very relevant because we actually get a letter of Jesus to churches. And I always want to think, what would Jesus say to our church today? At Westgate Church of Cross, what would Jesus say about our church? Where are we spiritually? What are the things that Jesus would point out uh, that he would commend us for? And what would be the things he might correct? So as we read these letters, let's read them with the hermeneutic of ourselves. And what I mean by that is, instead of thinking about what are the things that are just crazy that these people are doing, you know, we can critique and point the finger and go, okay, I don't know why this church has this issue. We need to ask the question that I think that's relevant. What do we do that's just as bad or worse in the 21st century? And I think we can learn from these churches. So let's get to the first church that we come to tonight, and that's the church at Thyatira. Thyatira, if you will notice, is one of the longest letters found in the seven letters written to the churches of Asia Minor. Colin Hamer, who is a, a scholar that has spent his life studying this area of the world, especially these ancient churches, Hamer has noticed that this is the longest letter, but Thyatira is probably the, the least of all of these cities. If you look at the seven cities that these letters are written to, this is the least significant city of all. So Thyatira was known as a manufacturing town. It had numerous trade guilds and, and unions. But we don't need to think of unions like in the, in the modern world. Trade unions and guilds were tied to paganism. So many times Christians would be locked out of certain trades because to be in a certain, let's just say if you're a, a shipper of goods using uh, the shipping industry. You may have to burn incense to Poseidon, uh, the god of the sea. So there was paganism tied to these trade guilds. So sometimes Christians could not participate in these trade guilds and they would lose their profession because of their Christian faith because they would refuse to burn incense to these idols. Inscriptions from this city show that it was populated by people of all kinds of trades and expertise. So Many artisans lived in the city of Thyatira. In Acts 16, 14, we meet a woman from Thyatira. You may remember Lydia, the seller of purple. And we know that Thyatira's trade reached across the Aegean Sea. We know that because Lydia had a home in Philippi, Macedonia. So we know trading was going across the Aegean Sea from uh, this city of Thyatira. So the trade guilds would pose a, a really difficult problem for Christians economically because of the paganism. Uh, the sun god Apollo was also the patron god of Thyatira. So even these cities had patron gods uh, that they had dedicated the city to. So I've mentioned this before in other classes, but it's just, you can't overstate how paganistic this culture was. It was permeating everything about this society from the food you ate to your trade guilds and uh, any type of recreation that you took part in, uh, dinner festivals, what's called the symposium. You'd have a dinner feast. They were all pagan. So paganism was dripping in everything that you did in the ancient world, especially in Asia Minor. So let's look at the letter that Jesus sends to the church at Thyatira. This is found in the close of chapter 2, Revelation 2, 18 through 29. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches minds and heart, 
and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan to say, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what, what you have until I come. The one who conquers, who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So we have this, these images and this message to Thyatira, eyes like burning torches would signify that Christ could see through the seductive arguments of this Jezebel. Feet of burnished bronze signify strength and splendor. The deeds that characterize the church at Thyatira are love, faith, service, and perseverance. Now Jezebel, we heard this name before in the Old Testament, in 2 Kings. Remember, this is the wicked queen of Ahab that led Israel into compromise and paganism with the Canaanite god of Baal. You may remember Elijah in this showdown with the prophets of Baal. This is the same queen, wicked queen Jezebel. Now, Jezebel could either be a specific person in this church, or this could be just a movement that Jesus embodies with her name. It's probably some type of Gnostic syncretism. Syncretism is the blending of Christianity with other faith systems. Gnosticism was a religion of secret knowledge. So when Jesus says the deep things of Satan, this would go well with Gnosticism. So Gnosticism would say that what you do in the body really doesn't matter. It's this deep spiritual religion. It's only what's up in your head or what's in your spirit. So you can, in your body, could do very immoral things. You could even eat food sacrificed to idols. You could go and pay homage to idols, but as long as in your, in your, as in your heart and your mind is this devotion to Christ, it's okay to do these things with your body. Now, this sounds a lot like what you see in American Christianity today. People will just practice blatant immorality, but at the same time, they'll say, well, it only matters what's in my heart. And they've totally misunderstood. If, if Jesus has your heart, then your actions will follow. So these Gnostics were dividing people up. You know, what you practice in your body doesn't matter. Just as long as you believe uh, in your heart, you can go do what you want to do. So this collusion with sin is what Jesus is calling them out for. That spirituality that does not embody your actions is a dead spirituality. So this is an important message that we could take to heart. That we as Christians need to be full body Christians obedient to Christ from the heart. Yes, he needs your heart, but also he needs our actions too, our obedience. It does matter. And we're told that they are called to finish and persevere. And it's so important to understand that perseverance matters. The next church we come up on in these letters is the church at Sardis. Sardis was a city that had seen its better days in the past. It was a glorious city. And around 500 years before Christ, it was probably at the zenith of its power. But by the Roman period, by the time these letters were written, this city was in great decline and it rested on its reputation of, of its past. Sardis was located on the side of Mount Tamalus and its Acropolis rose 1,500 feet above the Hermes Plain. So it's in a really pretty setting. The city's in a beautiful place. Sardis had a Roman theater and a temple dedicated to the city's patron god, Sybil. Now, Sybil was a female god that was very highly regarded by the Roman people. If you think back to history, maybe you learned this in Western civilization or world history, but the Sibylline Oracle informed the Romans that they needed to dedicate themselves to the goddess Sybil and they would have victory over Carthage. This happened in the Second Carthaginian War. And they did that and they won the battle and so they had this great regard for Sybil. So to find a city that holds Sybil in high regard would not be a shocking thing at all. Sybil was known by the Romans as Magna Mater, or their great mother of their religion. She supposedly also had the ability to raise people from the dead. But in AD 17, uh, Sardis suffered a horrible earthquake. You're going to realize a lot of these cities uh, in Asia Minor were destroyed by this disastrous earthquake. Sardis was not in a really good financial position at that time. And we know that the Roman government 
uh, loan them out $10 million in, in today's currency, basically, to rebuild the city. There was a gymnasium there. I'm going to show you a picture of what that gymnasium looked like. This is a, a typical uh, Greek, Greco-Roman gymnasium where you'd have a spa and a gymnasium. And also a lion. Now, this lion was connected with Sybil. Uh, whenever you look at altars of Sybil, you'll find these lines all around the altars of Sybil. So lions were connected to the worship of this goddess. Let's read the letter to the church at Sardis. And to the angel of Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains, and it is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, People who have not sold their garments, then they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do we notice this church is in danger? This church does not have the problems of the other churches, like with heresy and outside pressure. Sardis's problem is they are about to be snuffed out. The very existence of this church is in question. So they may appear to be living, but they're actually dead. It makes you think of the fig tree in Mark eleven twenty. 20. It had leaves, but it did not bear fruit. And this is what this church is dealing with. It looks vibrant on the outside. It looks the part, but inwardly this church is dying. Many commentators believe the seven spirits of God represent the perfection of found in the Holy Spirit. Don't take this as literal, like there are seven Holy Spirits. There is one Holy Spirit, but this seven means completeness. So numerically, I mean, it really throws us off as Western peoples, Americans, when we hear words like seven spirits, but don't let that throw you, out, throw you off. Just understand that's complete, completion. And this reconciles the idea that the Spirit be sent to the world to convict people of sin and lead them to Christ. So this is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit. The idea of Christ confessing us before the heavenly court takes us back to the Gospels in Matthew 10, 32. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. So this is a church that is thoroughly secularized to the point of being irrelevant. Now I will say, do we have that same problem today in our churches? Have we become so secularized in our entertainment, in our dress, in our taste, how we spend our money, how we think? Have we become so secularized that we're really no different than the world? And if that's the case, then we would have a lot in common with Sardis. And Jesus says that puts you in danger of not even being a church. Now that's scary when you think about it. That's heavy stuff. Let's talk about Philadelphia now, switching gears to the next congregation. Philadelphia was known as the gateway to the east. This is going to link up Mesopotamia to the Ionian uh, cities. And the Ionian cities would be the ones that uh, are thoroughly Hellenized, that are thoroughly Greek. And so Mesopotamia would be the east. Think of Persia. And so this city kind of acted as a link to east and west. It was located near a volcanic plain and it had rich soil. And they were known for growing grapes. So think of lush grapevines and grapes there in Philadelphia. The same earthquake we've already talked about also leveled Philadelphia. But Philadelphia rebuilt it with the imperial treasury. Once again, the Roman Empire stepped in and helped out. It was the youngest of the seven cities of Asia mentioned in Revelation, being founded in about, probably about 150 years before Christ was born. The name Philadelphia is interesting. It comes from Italus II Philadelphus. Italus II was the brother of Eumenes II, the king of Pergamum. Italus II was the younger brother, but he loved his older brother, Eumenes. He loved him so much that the city became known as the city of brotherly love because of his love for his brother. The worship of Dionysus, that should not shock us because this place was, was known for growing grapes. So Dionysus was a very popular uh, worship, very popular goddess in uh, Philadelphia because uh, they liked wine and they liked grapes. Philadelphia was the center of Hellenization. So taking Greco or Greek culture in particular to Asia Minor, 
This was kind of the place where it happened. Uh, Hellas is the, the Greek word for Greece. Uh, so Hellenization is the idea of taking Greek culture, like Greek language and the whole idea of gymnasiums and amphitheater, theaters, and all the things that they held dear, taking it and replicating it in different places. Philadelphia was a place where emperor worship was practiced beginning in the reign of Tiberius. So this is before the writing of this book. This city is already a hotbed for worshiping the emperor. So there's some pictures I want to show you really quick of uh, Philadelphia. First of all, there's the amphitheater uh, there, and it's a large, I don't know if you can see in the picture well enough, but you can see some modern buildings around it. And some of these buildings are four to five stories tall, and this amphitheater is bigger than these modern buildings. I mean, they, this amphitheater dwarfs the modern buildings around it, so it's a huge amphitheater. Then another picture I want to share with you, and it's just a sad reminder of the history of Asia Minor and what happened. But as you notice to the right here, this one picture, is the Basilica of St. John that was built in the 600s. Notice in the background what you see. You see a Muslim minaret. And so a lot of these cities were thoroughly Christian back in the ancient world. Some of the centers of Christianity would be places like Alexandria, Egypt, places like a modern day Iraq and Iran were places, centers of Christianity. Jerusalem would be a center of Christianity. And all of those places now are predominantly Muslim and the Christian populations are very small persecuted minorities. So that tells you something about we can't kind of sometimes forget the history of, of how Christianity spread. What's interesting as a side note is the center of Christianity in the next 30 to 40 years is going to be the global south. We've always thought of Christianity being a movement in Western Europe and in America, in the Western Hemisphere. But actually the population center for Christianity is going to shift to the global south, to Latin America and Africa in particular, where you're going to find most Christians. So even uh, the population shift of, of Christianity is changing even today. But this is a humongous basilica, the Basilica of St. John. And that makes sense that you would have a church dedicated to John who wrote this book of Revelation. I thought you might find that interesting. Let's read this letter to Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, one who has the key of David, who opens, no one will shut, who shuts, no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I love you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven. In my own new name, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So much here to talk about, but Jesus calls himself the Holy One. And this is a title only ascribed to Yahweh in the Old Testament, the Holy One. So this tells you that Jesus is God. The keys of David, it's a reference back to Isaiah 22. If you have time, you want to go back and read Isaiah 22. But basically, this idea of the keys, it's an authority symbol. So in ancient Israel, you would have a king. Let's say in Isaiah 22, the king is Hezekiah, and he is a Davidic king. And he would have a viceroy. A viceroy is the vicar. He is the prime minister. He is kind of like second in command. And so the king would literally give him giant keys to the household. And he would lay these keys up on his shoulder. And that was symbolic that the viceroy had power. He had authority. So Jesus is the Davidic king. And by saying he has the keys, he is saying he has authority. He is telling the church at Philadelphia, he is the one with authority. He promises that he's going to open a door for his church. I would say this is probably a door of opportunity for mission. You know, they are already going to have gone through all kinds of trials and tribulations. They're not being promised they're going to get raptured out, but there's going to be some type of trial and tribulation that Jesus will spare them from. 
But this church has been so faithful to Jesus and his prayer for all of us is not that he would take us out of this world, but he would protect us from the evil one. That's what really matters. Not hardships and suffering. Those are gonna come. We've been promised that, that we're gonna have hardships and suffering. But what Jesus wants for us is perseverance, not to give in to the evil one. And this church at Philadelphia had all kinds of pressure upon them. A, a fully Hellenized city, a very pagan city, a city where there was a Jewish element that was also persecuting them. So not only did they have to worry about emperor worship and paganism, but they also had Jewish people persecuting them at the same time. And this church held strong. And maybe you've noticed a pattern in these letters. The churches that are persecuted, the churches that have hardship are usually the healthy churches. They're the ones that usually are doing well. Let's talk about Laodicea, the last church we're gonna talk about this evening. And this is several miles north, northwest. If you go to Laodicea, there's a, there's a mountain. And, and on top of this mountain is a city known as Hierapolis. Now, Hierapolis is an interesting city if you ever wanna study its history. It was a city where a lot of retired Roman soldiers went to, to live. So on top of a mountain, northwest of Laodicea is this city. At the base of Hierapolis is a hot spring that caused a beautiful white mineral deposit that they think you could have seen from Laodicea. Standing, you could see it like a snow-capped mountain off in the distance. Also, off in the distance, but also visible to Laodicea, see, it was the city of Colossae. Y'all have heard of Colossae? Paul wrote the book of Colossians to that church. Colossae had something that neither Hierapolis nor Laodicea had. Colossae boasted a refreshing cold spring of water. What made Laodicea such an oddity was that it had no access to fresh water. They didn't have a river, a lake, or, or spring to draw from. So they had to import their water via an aqueduct from Hierapolis and Colossae. But when the water arrived in Laodicea, it had lost its unique quality. So it's not hot, it's not cold. It's just tepid, what we would call lukewarm. So it's also located at the juncture of a lot of trade routes. So this is a place, Laodicea is a place where uh, people are gonna come and bring all kinds of ideas. In the time of the writing of this book, Laodicea was one of the richest cities in Asia. The city was known for its wool. This is gonna be interesting when you think about the message of this church. So as you read the message, think about what they're known for. They're known for wool that's silky and black in color. They're known for a tunic named uh, Tremita, and it was world-renowned. So if you wanted to get the, the tunic that was the best, it was like Naki, I guess, you get it from Laodicea. They were also known for an ear and eye salve uh, that were used. They were famous for people, especially their eye salve was very popular. They had a large Jewish population that was brought from Babylon. At the time that this letter was written, the male population was around 7,500 Jews at that time. Uh, here's some pictures from Laodicea. There's the temple to Apollo. For a long time, they didn't know what this temple was dedicated to. Now they know it's dedicated to Apollo. Then you have the colonnade, which is this pillared street uh, coming into Laodicea. So a very beautiful city uh, with beautiful architecture. Revelation, let's look at the, the message in Revelation 3, 14 through 22 to Laodicea. And this is a very famous church, famous message. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works, you're neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so you may be rich, and white garments you may clothe yourselves, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I sent at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. So I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
Now, lukewarm. Now, this, this is a very famous reference, but a lot of times we've misread this. The critique of Jesus, he's not saying you've got to be hot. You know, so many times we thought, man, this is red hot evangelism. That's what he's talking about. No, Laodicea's faith was tepid. It was not remarkable. He wanted them to have remarkable faith. So that they had a lukewarm faith. He's like, hey, either be hot or cold, be remarkable, but have a faith that stands out, not a faith that's just tepid like the water that you drink in Laodicea. In verse 17, he describes their condition as miserable, wretched, poor, naked, and blind. Now, did you notice he picked out the strengths of this city that calls them out as spiritual deficiencies? That's how well Jesus knows the situation in this town. Miserable, wretched, poor. The city was known for its great wealth, but they had missed out on what was really important, seeking God's kingdom first. So their great wealth had caused them to compromise in so many ways. They were naked. The city was known for its garments and tunics, but Paul reminds us that we are to clothe, be clothed with Christ. So you've got this idea of being clothed with the righteousness of Jesus, these white garments. Also, he told them, you know, you need gold refined with fire. We know from 1 Corinthians 3 and other places that true faith in Jesus that will stand is faith that's been tested by tribulation and it stands strong. Jesus tells this church, that's what you guys need. They're blind. The city of Laodicea was known for its eye treatments, but this church was blinded to the truth. So Jesus talks about this, even in his ministry, being blinded to the truth. And this church is blinded. So he lets them know he wants to come and sit down and dine with them and have a meal. And in the Eastern context, sharing a common meal shows a strong familial relationship. Many early Christians interpreted this as a Eucharistic meal, what we would call the Lord's Supper. Is being a foreshadowing of this great banquet of the Lord. In other words, when we take the Lord's Supper as God's people, Jesus is really the host, and we're there dining with our Savior, and that's an advanced sign of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let me give you a little picture of how N.T. Wright sees that. I think this is fascinating. N.T. Wright says that just as the Israelite people uh, they sent spies in the land, and the spies brought back fruit from the land of Canaan. And on the plains of Moab, standing outside the promised land, they ate food from the promised land, the land of promise. In the same way, we as Christians eat the food of heaven, so to speak, in the Lord's Supper. And it's an advanced sign of the banquet feast we're going to experience one day when we have the true inheritance of heaven. So that's an interesting way to look at it. Jesus talks about, too, that you'll have this uh, permission to sit on thrones. And that would remind you of Matthew 19 when he tells his apostles that they will sit on thrones dwelling, uh, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So that shouldn't throw us off too much. So we can take these messages to heart. Let's just think tonight what we've learned so far, that the churches that tend to do the best are the ones under intense persecution. Compromising with the world system of thought is not a good idea. We don't need to water down Christianity and have Christianity in light. Sometimes wealth and great affluence, sometimes having all this stuff can be a distraction. So we need to be reminded to have a remarkable faith, not a lukewarm faith, but a remarkable faith, to have a faith that will stand the test of trials and tribulations. And Jesus encourages us to finish well. We are to persevere. He says this, oh, people sometimes have a, problem with that doctrine. But you can't read through the book of Revelation and come up with a different idea. Unless Jesus is just trying to confuse you, which I doubt the Lord would do that, he is expecting us to persevere until the end, until we take our final breath, to stay faithful to Jesus. Because I'll tell you something, Jesus will stay faithful to us. Well, with that, we're going to close out tonight's class and I hope to see you back when we go to Lesson 7. Next week, we're going to delve into Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. And boy, it's going to get interesting pretty quick when we get to those chapters. But I thank you for coming along on this journey. And I hope it's blessing you along the way. God bless.